Opening Credits David DeAngelis presents The Secret of Secrets, Your Key to Subconscious Power by Yule S. Anderson. Digitally narrated using the voice of Edward Herman. Forward. This book is intended to show how the spiritual realization of an indwelling God may be applied to the various problems of everyday living. My previous book, Three Magic Words, ended with the revelation that man's consciousness is God's consciousness in process of becoming. The secret of secrets begins with this premise, then lays down a method by which such awareness may be used for the practical end of a richer and fuller life. This method is somewhat like yoga. It was indicated by Sri. Aurobindo in summing up the Bhagavad Gita when he wrote, The secret of action is one with the secret of life. Life is not for the sake of life alone, but for God. Action is for self-finding and not for its external fruits. There is an inner law of all things dependent on the supreme as well as the manifested nature of the self. The truth of works lies there. The largest law of action is therefore to find the truth of your highest and inmost existence and live in it. Only by discovering your true self can your doings be perfected in a divinely authentic action. Know then yourself. Know your true self to be God and one with the self of all others. The method offered for mastery over life is to make a sacrament of every thought and deed, giving each to the Lord and Master of creation without attachment to results. By such a procedure a man gradually frees himself of the limitations of personal ego and comes to understand that a larger power a greater self may be unloosed through his own nature. He sees that it is God who thinks in him, God who wills in him, God who acts through him, and a new spiritual center of gravity is established. The ego dissolves, God consciousness comes, and a man's peace and power are immensely enhanced because he moves in tune with the infinite. On the surface this appears a contradiction to the generally accepted premise that positive thinking can change one's life, but in fact that premise is developed here far beyond such psychological limitations. Positive thinking alone is not the key to attainment, else there never would be a confident failure. Man is not bigger than God, and in the end, it avails him only heartache to impose his ego will on God's will. Yet man is far more than a puppet. He is God himself in process of becoming, and it is by seeking out the nature of this real self that he prospers. This, however, he cannot do without first having a positive viewpoint of life. He must believe in his own immortality, in the assured ends of truth, justice, beauty, and brotherhood on earth, and when at last he has laid aside ego and glimpsed the limitless dimensions of his true spiritual being, then he sees that nothing is impossible to him. He achieves divine consciousness, his word is law, his thoughts rule the universe. Such is his destiny. To that end, may this book lead you. Chapter 1. The Core of the Problem We Punish Ourselves Alex was a middle-aged man in a Midwestern city. His history was an astonishing record of failure. Whatever he turned his hand to eventually crumbled about him. There came a time when he could not even find a job. He and his family were destitute. His wife said, I can't understand it. Alex is the kindest man I've ever known. He's a hard worker, and I know he's smart. Other men, smaller, meaner men, are successful. But poor Alex, all his luck is bad. Does he think so? she was asked. She nodded. He believes God is punishing him. It took a long time to persuade Alex that God punishes no one. His guilt complex was so deeply rooted that he was dangerously passive. He felt compelled to be kind to others because of this guilt, but he expected nothing but misfortune in return. His personality was so involuted that he lived as if in a funnel. He was all turned in on himself. Only when he began to sense finally the infinite spiritual presence of God did his ego start to dissolve. Then he began to see other people for the first time, not as extensions of his own personality, but as living embodiments of God. His sense of personal worth grew as he gained humility. One day he was offered a job by a chance acquaintance. Today he is a vice president in that company. The president says of him, 
Alex inspires confidence. Something looks out of his eyes and says, I like you. Let's be partners. God consciousness indeed has remade the life of this one-time failure. Seeds of Destiny Each of us carries within him the spiritual causes that determine his destiny. Sometimes these causes are not so much spiritual as psychological prompters, and when they become twisted through fear, hate, bitterness, or resentment, our lives can be driven calamitously. But psychological prompters, no matter how deeply buried in the subconscious, can be overcome by spiritual understanding. This understanding may be arrived at by intellectual grasp, by suffering, or simply by humility, very often by all three, but once arrived at it is as a new birth of the soul. That which you fancy yourself to be you never have really been, for it is a thing that changes with the seasons and alters with the tides. What you truly are is a permanent thing, changeless, with its foundations planted in eternity. To let go of the old self and cleave to the new is the essence of spiritual growth. This new birth without which, Jesus said, a man cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, completely alters the world. He who views the world through the ego sees all things as existing outside himself. He feels separate, isolated, and the world appears to him as a series of unrelated things and objects, all possessing certain inherent dangers to his own being. He feels small, harassed, unloved, to him the world seems cruel and unjust. Yet when he awakens to his true spiritual self, all the old fears and hates and resentments dissolve. He then sees his kinship with all things, attains to spiritual identification with them, grows into a spiritual oneness with all creation that no longer leaves room for his personal ego and its wounds and vanities. By letting go of his small self he attains to a vast self, a self that encompasses all things. Then at last he recognizes with Walt Whitman the whole theory of the universe is directed to one individual, namely to you. Spiritual Rebirth It is through spiritual rebirth that we overcome all things. It is through our growth into the spiritual image of God that the purpose of life itself is fulfilled. For that purpose did spirit first become involved in matter. To that end, shall it one day be free. We are such materialists in this age of electronics and atom bombs that there is often much scoffing about the spiritual existence of man. Many there are who state that man is body only, that he comes into existence as a machine destined to run a certain length of time, that the apparent director within him is only an illusion fostered by the machine's acquisition of rational habit patterns. What a desert of mind and soul such a belief must be! What else can the holder of such a belief do but spin out his futile existence in a web of frustration and resentment? Look into the eyes of your loved ones, and you know at once the living presence of spirit. It need not be weighed, measured, and counted. It is there, and you recognize it. All the mathematics and logic in the world can neither prove nor disprove it. But you know it just the same. Spirit recognizes spirit, for it is the same in each of us, invisible and indivisible. This knowledge, though it exists in the intuitive center of every man, nevertheless needs some logical justification before it can break through the mental barriers of this materialistic age. It is all well and good, says the materialist, to talk of feelings and intuitions, but you must admit that they cannot be proved or disproved. What religion needs is something concrete, a fact, something provable. Well, feelings are provable. All of us recognize an act of bravery an act of love, an act of kindness, why then must there always be so much doubt over the validity of the conduct of a man who claims to know God? All actions spring from feelings, many of them from the most spiritual feelings. And if it were not for these intangibles, which no one can weigh, measure, or even classify adequately, this world would be as still and silent as a tomb. Master of Creation It is spirit, soul, consciousness that is ever first cause, master and mover of creation, alpha and omega of existence. It is God's stuff, infinite, eternal, changeless, arrested but a moment in form, manifesting its myriad appearances as a dancer might display infinite numbers of costumes, but remaining always one, indivisible and changeless. This is God, not a giant-sized man, not even a God as we might imagine in our minds and make an image of. 
but a power, a presence, a being, an infinite intelligence pervading all and creating all, yet remaining unaltered amongst the ever-changing. A professor at a Western university was illustrating to his class examples of deductive and inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning, he stated, is to reason from an effect to a cause. For example, I know I exist. I did not make myself or the world I live in. Therefore, I deduce that someone else did. This someone I call God. Now, inductive reasoning, on the other hand, is to reason from cause to effect. For example, I know that I think, and that this thinking increases my knowledge. Inductive reasoning, therefore, tells me that I may increase knowledge of my Creator through taking thought. That, gentlemen, in a nutshell, is all that is going on in the world. Wise man, he knew God through mind, but truth to tell, he also knew Him through his heart. Shedding the Ego Now the core of the problem of existence is this. Most of us believe ourselves to be creatures of circumstance, pushed around by the whims of fate and buffeted on all sides by forces over which we have no control. When we do manage to persuade ourselves that we can exercise control over our inner and outer lives, we often do so with a magnified ego that has convinced us of our power through fostering the illusion that we are better than others. Obviously such a delusion is doomed to short life. We attain to mastery neither through magnified ego, the worst of all possible solutions, nor through an involuted ego that brings a sense of personal worthlessness. We take the first and most important step to mastery by shedding the ego altogether and identifying ourselves with God. While the foregoing may be read by many, it will be the rare reader who at once penetrates its meaning. For to let go of personal self is to suffer a kind of death. To shed the ego means to attain to a state of personal abstraction, wherein we can view ourselves with detachment, neither condoning nor condemning, aware of our personal existence, neither more nor less than we are aware of the existence of our fellows. It is this state of consciousness that teaches us to love our neighbors as ourselves, not necessarily through an increased love for our neighbors, but more through a less personalized and more detached regard for ourselves. In this state we learn to identify ourselves with a greater consciousness, a vast intelligence. We feel it underlying our existence, buoying us up, supporting us, giving us our awareness. Little by little we expand to meet it, until that which we were, our ego begins to recede, until at last we view our personal existence as through the inverted end of a telescope. Now we begin to see what we truly are and to let go of what we never really have been. Now the world is changed. It has no more resemblance to what it was before than we have to what we were before, for in the words of Evelyn Underhill, we behold at any specific moment not that which is, but that which we are. The Infinite Power God, first cause, unlimited consciousness, infinite intelligence, involves himself in matter and manifests in myriad forms, not to prove anything, not to fight anything, not to overcome anything, not to separate right from wrong, but only for the pure joy of expression, and this, as we know it, is the beginning of things, of the manifest world, of the stars, of the planets of life. God himself becomes involved in matter, and what he becomes, while infinitely less than himself in form and substance, nevertheless is himself, true and entire, in spiritual potential. Nothing can become this or that but God. God is all, there is nothing else. And so consciousness is arrested in form, in being, spun out in space and time as a man or a woman, calling itself by a name, peering outward at a world that seems to dwarf it, overcome by problems, because it assumes itself to be contained within that world, rather than perceiving the truth, which is that the world is contained within it. This is man, who has isolated himself with his developing ego, cut himself off from the roots of his power, which are firmly placed in the reaches of space and time. Something Deep Inside Joe McAdams was a strong, husky young man, a flyer in World War II. Joe had a vast appetite for life. He played and fought and laughed and frolicked, and in general comported himself like an enthusiastic bear cub. Then one day his plane was shot down. Joe was wounded in both legs, but managed to parachute from the flaming ship. He landed in the sea, where he floated for hours in his life jacket. Sharks attacked him. Joe fought them with his knife. 
When he finally was picked up, he barely was conscious and had nearly bled to death. Both legs were so badly damaged they had to be amputated. Joe, intensely physical, joyous Joe, faced life as a cripple. He went into a state of shock. Though conscious, he would talk to no one. He had to be force-fed. The plain fact was that Joe no longer wanted to live. He apparently had taken the mental stand that if he couldn't be whole in body, he wanted nothing further to do with life. He grew gaunt and pale. His skin hung lifelessly on his mangled body. Yet he did not die. Some spark within him resisted. For many months he seemed to hover on the very brink of death. Then he began to recover. First sign was a return of color to his face. Then his eyes grew brighter. Then one day he smiled. After that, he rapidly regained his strength. With a zest he entered into the rehabilitation program, learned how to be expert with his new artificial legs, set about studying hard so that he eventually was accepted at one of the East's finest engineering schools. Today Joe holds a responsible job with one of the nation's leading manufacturers. Those who know and love him realize that a great change has been wrought in this young man, a change far greater and deeper than that undergone by his scarred body. There has been a subtle but deep change in his entire personality, in his very character. He is still the vital, energetic Joe everyone knew. But now around all his actions and words, there hangs a new aura, a kind of otherworldliness, a spiritual quality that the old Joe McAdams never showed. Joe was asked about this. I guess it's pretty obvious I've changed, he said. Inside, I mean, where it really counts. And it's more than just a change. The old Joe McAdams died out there on that Pacific Atoll, where he lost his legs. I'm the new Joe, and I was born on that same Pacific Atoll. I was born one day when I realized that everything in life changes and fades away. And the only thing that stays is something inside you. Something that is you, and yet is not you and is big and powerful and always there. It's God, I think. That's what really changed me. Spiritual Realization Do you assume for one moment that some freak of circumstance, some coincidental arrangement of atoms and molecules, some bizarre chance from among an infinite number of chances, has caused you to exist? Have you not looked inward on yourself and become startled beyond all possibility of recovery? by the tremendous and sudden awareness that you are you? There are no words to express the true miracle of this self-discovery. That the world exists, the planets, the stars, the mountains, oceans, seas, is a workaday thing, the substance of life, the backdrop against which the play is staged. But suddenly to realize that you, that unique and individual you, are here, are witness, are called into being. This is to know God, fully and surely. Such a realization forever lays to rest all materialistic philosophy, all atheism, all agnosticism. God is, you are, God is in you. One evening a professor of mathematics, a forceful experimenter and a questing man, was told of such spiritual revelation. You say you experience this thing, he answered. So I believe you. All right, let's accept it. God manifests himself in myriad forms through the mere joy of his being, and what he becomes is less than himself for a moment, but truly himself in eternity. What's the point? Surely you recognize that people suffer. Many people you must have known have gone through anguish, because they had not resources to cope with some worldly situation, and thus were forced to suffer. Who suffered then, these people or God? And if either or both, why? Surely God is no masochist, enjoying self-punishment. Yet why does he become less than himself and literally frustrate and torture himself? It is not God who suffers, or even the people, he was told. It is only the mask God has donned that suffers, and this does not truly exist, but is only illusion. Is it illusion when a man is dying of cancer, and he cannot even withhold his screams at the pain? That which suffers is an illusion, bound to illusions fed by illusions. This is ego, the sense of personal isolation from God. When an individual surrenders his ego, he then identifies himself with God and no longer can suffer, nor can he die. Cancer cannot kill him, for cancer is an illusion. 
even as that which it preys upon, is an illusion. You would have a most difficult time explaining that to the American Medical Association, the professor answered. There is even a difficult time explaining it to those already convinced that spiritual causes precede physical causes. But that does not alter its validity. A whistle can be made that sounds a note so shrill that only the rare human ear can hear it. To the great majority of mankind, the whistle is silent. But that does not mean it does not sound its note. There are those who hear the whistle. There are those who perceive God and thus are free of the sufferings of the ego. Then it is your belief that disease is just one of the sufferings of the ego? Yes. What, in your opinion, causes disease? The distortions of the ego. Fear, hate, bitterness, resentment, jealousy, guilt, and their cousins. These work on the subconscious, call into existence physical counterparts to match the suffering ego. And what is the cure? Shedding the ego and making a spiritual identification with God. Failing that, see your doctor. He laughed. I shall see mine first, thank you. He didn't, however. Since that evening, our professor has come a long way in spiritual discovery. His naturally inquisitive mind has led him down many roads, but now he is vigorous in his contention that all physical manifestation has a spiritual cause, and that disease itself is just one more evidence of man's being out of joint with his spiritual source. Life against life It is indeed difficult to shed feelings of separateness and isolation, for it almost seems that these are foisted upon us by the very nature of life. We look about us, and on all sides we see living things preying on living things. The oft-repeated picture of a number of fish, each successively larger than the next, and simultaneously swallowing each other, seems to give us our most apt picture of life, the eater. Eating is eaten. It is from this observation of what Darwin termed the survival of the fittest, that we perhaps develop our submerged hostilities and general cynicism toward the underlying lovingness of God. It is from this observation that we perhaps even develop our atheism, our spiritual hopelessness, our existentialism, our feelings that life is against us. What we fail to perceive is that God is all, that nothing is ever lost, strayed, or unredeemed. No one falls but what another takes his place, and no one truly falls, and no one truly wins, for each is God. Do you think for a moment that God wins victories over himself? Yet the plain and irrevocable fact is this. Life feeds on life. In the drama unfolded by master intelligence manifesting itself in myriad forms through the mere joy of existence, the procession of movement through time and space and matter is accomplished through one form being destroyed and replaced by another better and more serviceable and therefore truer form. Thus, life feeds on life. It is almost as if God is thinking, and each of his thoughts manifests a form, and then another truer thought absorbs the old one, making a new form, and so on. God becoming Now, of course, we come to the standard shout of dismay. How can it be, the egoist moans, that a just and loving God would conceive such a method of unfolding himself? A method that visits untold suffering upon his children as they are forced to struggle, to suffer pain, be defeated, and finally die. And the answer to this question is that it is illusion that we are separate from God, it is illusion that we are children of God, for each of us in his true nature is God himself, whole and entire, and God does not suffer pain, defeat, or death. Only the ego suffers pain, is defeated, and dies. And the ego is illusion only, and never exists at all. Why does God don this illusion then? Why, in each of his separate existences, does he not know himself as God instead of as some individual person? The answer to that is the answer to the riddle of existence. When the infinite becomes the finite, it forsakes the inherent perception of the infinite, and its understanding becomes that of the thing it has become. Thus God, becoming a thing, no longer knows himself as God, but only as the thing he has become. The thing he has become is the ego of the thing. It does not in any way alter the nature of God, nor is it even truth in itself, but simply exists as a consciousness to fit the form. Yet always underlying it is the consciousness of God, infinite, eternal, 
with vast reservoirs of knowledge and power seeping ever upward, molding the thing ever better, molding always through strife between ego and ego, yet underlying all with love. Mirror on the World Mount Whitney is the highest peak in the Sierras. From its slopes it is possible to look eastward on a clear day into the vast reaches of rugged Nevada. Nowhere, as far as the eye can see, is there sign of another human life. You can look upward, focus on a pinpoint in the blue, look outward, and the land undulates to a level horizon, look downward, and the earth seems remote, detached, the habitat and handiwork of another race. Here you can sense yourself as the very center of the universe. All lines of force and purpose pass through you. Move and the center moves with you. All things meet and resolve themselves here. You are the center of an unimaginable circle, whose circumference is nowhere and whose center is everywhere, so that anyone, no matter who or what or where he may be, sensing the circle, senses himself as the center. This is God's universe. It is infinitely one. No matter our spiritual dedication, however, material life continually forces itself upon us. Daily we meet tensions, competitions, exertions, emotional peaks and lassitudes, so that it is almost as if we were riding a roller coaster over bounding forces that we do not and cannot control. We feel isolated in our fleshy prisons and long for the touch and contact of another hand, the consolation that someone else exists and feels the same as we, alone also, reaching out. We are constantly beset by feelings of inferiority and personal unworthiness, so that we adopt standards that are all based on our comparison with others. People are better looking, worse looking, smarter, dumber, taller, shorter, thinner, fatter, poorer, wealthier, stronger, weaker, healthier, sicker, more talented, less talented, always in reference to ourselves. We hold up a mirror to the world, and the mirror is our ego. We see everything through it, and everything is colored accordingly. You see only what you are. Henry David Thoreau wrote what a man thinks of himself, that it is which determines or rather indicates his fate. It is this peculiarity of the ego, that it can only see what it already is, that blinds us to the vast possibilities of our lives. If the ego feels unloved, it finds only an unloving world. If it hates, the world hates it. If it is bitter and cynical, he knows only a bitter and cynical world. Rare is the man and wise who perceives that all possibilities are right where he is. He need only change his perception to see them. He doesn't create them by changing his perception. He only becomes aware that they are there. They existed all the time. It is this spiritual and psychological law that all change must first be wrought in consciousness before it can be perceived in the outer world that gives life its exciting possibilities. Each of us can, by an act of mental decision, alter his consciousness and thus alter his life. This is not to say, for example, that by some miracle you one day can be incapable of comprehending higher calculus and the next understand it perfectly simply because you have decided to understand it. Decide to understand it and you remove the barriers to understanding it. You first may have to learn arithmetic, algebra, plane and solid geometry, and a number of similar tools, but if your decision is made firmly, one day you will find yourself understanding calculus. The seeds of all possibilities exist within you. There is nothing too great, too vast, too undreamed of that you might not aspire to it, and in time have it grow into the image of your dream. The Power of Decision a few years ago a young man came to Hollywood in an empty boxcar of a freight train. He had no money and only the few clothes on his back. He washed the dirt from his face in the restroom of a gas station and went immediately to the gates of 20th Century Fox Studios, where he requested an audience with Mr. Darrell Zanuck, production head of the studio. The gateman took in his soiled clothes, his lack of coat and tie. His face clouded with outrage. Get out of here, he shouted. No bums or panhandlers allowed. The young man left, crestfallen. He had been so sure that his confidence, his very brash hopefulness, would gain him the audience he sought, that he had not even considered the possibility of failure. He could not even get through the gates of a studio. He was so shaken that he couldn't bring himself to try another. But that night he came to a decision. 
he would be an actor no matter the hardships and disappointments. He would let nothing daunt him. He would work, he would learn, he would study. And in the end he made this solemn resolve. He would be an actor. Next day he found a job washing dishes in a restaurant. He discovered a school for young actors, complete with theatre. He did well in a tryout, and when it was discovered he was short of funds, he was given a job as custodian of the building in return for his tuition fees. He was also allowed to sleep in the theatre. He spent three years in this manner, working, intent on his resolution. Then one day as he was walking down the street, he was stopped and asked if he were an actor. He answered he was. He was offered a screen test. After the test came a contract, then a small part, then a larger one, then a starring role. Today he is one of Hollywood's biggest stars, secure at the top of his profession because he knows his job so well. Many will insist that our young man would have been stopped on the street and asked if he were an actor regardless of whether he had spent those years working and studying to prepare himself, but we must insist otherwise. It was no coincidence that he was stopped. The quality of his consciousness attracted this circumstance to him, and his consciousness had been tempered to that quality by the years of training and discipline he had subjected himself to. Thus it is that always we call into existence around us those images that we visualize in the depths of our being, and any man, by the power of his decision, has the capacity to change his consciousness and thereby change his life. It is by expanding our consciousness, then, that we may influence and even control our destinies, and the tool with which we are able to accomplish this is by forsaking the ego and identifying ourselves with God. It is obvious that an all-wise and omnipotent God is aware of all things, past, present, and future. It is similarly obvious that the will of a person or individual ego imposed upon the will of God is not going to change God's plan. It is through such realization that we become aware of the futility and the suffering caused by the exertion of ego will, but it is also through this realization that we run up against one of the greatest snags in the doctrine of free will as against that of predestination. For our contention is that despite the fact that all things in the future are known to God, man himself is possessed of free will, freedom to determine the events and happenings of his life. Free Will and Predestination Some contend that if God knows what is going to happen, that particular thing must happen, and man cannot alter it, and therefore he is a mere puppet and does not have free will. But the mistake that these contenders make is that they are thinking of man as ego, rather than as a part of God, or even God himself. Man is not separate from God. It is only the illusion of his ego that makes him appear so. And God is not deluded. Therefore he does not recognize man as man, or individual men as individual men. When there is a thing to be done in the plan that he holds, he knows that he himself in one of his myriad forms will do it. He does not concern himself whether this particular form has the illusion that it is Bill Jones or Ed Brown. He only follows the law of his nature, and the consciousness best suited to the thing accomplishes the thing. Thus it is that as individual egos we have complete freedom, freedom to change or alter or improve the quality of our consciousness so that it will be best suited to the thing we want to do. When the consciousness has been so altered the thing to be done is inevitably attracted. This is God's law. It is therefore through the alteration of consciousness and not through exertion of will that all things come to us. Ego will is for one thing only, and that is to impose discipline upon itself. The power to make a decision lies in the power to discipline the ego, and it is here and only here that ego will may be and even must be exerted. Ego will never can be exerted over things, over people. To attempt to do so only creates the opposite reaction. Confine your use of will power to yourself, to self-discipline, self-control. Develop in yourself the power to make clear-cut and firm decisions, to stick to them no matter the obstacles. In that manner you will expand your consciousness to meet the goals you have set for yourself. Forsaking Ego Will In all things other than self-discipline, we must learn to forsake ego will and subject ourselves to the will of God. This is not the subjection we might first think it to be, for all we are doing is forsaking the ego, which is illusion anyway.
and attuning ourselves to the will of our greater self, which is God. By subjecting ourselves to the will of God, we recognize Him not only in ourselves, but in the world around us, in the people we meet, in the objects and things and circumstances of our days. We begin to see things as a whole, and we begin to find our places in that whole according to the quality of our consciousness, a consciousness that now is taking on greater and greater powers because it has begun to identify itself with God. In all things we see the master hand, and in many things the hand of the master becomes our own. One sometimes hears it said by those who have buried three-fourths of their natures, that there is nothing in this world worthwhile except those things that have proven they are facts by taking form. A tree, they say, is a fact. It exists as a tangible thing and bears its own testimony to its existence, so that nothing more need be said about it. Even the kinds of trees, elm, birch, fir, cedar, etc., can be recognized without difficulty, so that no debates, arguments, or theories need be postulated about them. All ideas, emotions, and feelings, say these materialists, are merely reactions of individual natures to a world full of things that are facts, but which individual natures attempt to disguise in order to make them conform to personal desires. This last thesis, however, certainly smacks a good deal of an idea in itself, and perhaps defeats the entire contention. In any case, defeated it is. For nothing in the world is more impotent than a thing in itself, and nothing in this world is more potent than an idea in itself. Form out of idea. Follow the process of creation, and you will see that the idea always precedes the thing, and the thing is never the whole embodiment of the idea, but only a partial manifestation of a vision dimly seen and partially understood. This particular conclusion not only may be applied to art, music, literature as the obviously creative fields, but as easily can be applied to the worlds of medicine, physics, chemistry, and electronics. A Tolstoy bringing forth from the recesses of his subconscious those ideas, which took the concrete form of war and peace, is still no more a creator than Newton pondering the falling apple, and from it arriving at the law of gravity. Each entertained an idea, each gave it form. It is this power of decision, this law of form out of idea that is at once our salvation and our undoing. Sensing it, we sense all power within ourselves, but at the same time we build a wall around it that insists it into the small thing the ego is. We can be anything we wish to be, take any stand we wish to take, the decision is ours. But as long as such decision or stand is motivated by the ego, it can have no greater power than that of the ego, which is scarcely any power at all. If there is one thing in all life that is an unavoidable conclusion, it is that all things are the manifestation of some directing intelligence with an absolute purposefulness of design. Life is going somewhere, is unfolding something, has a definite goal, and these things, even the most egoistic of us must admit, are in the hands of no man or even group of men, but rather rest in the lap of the intelligence that created all. Once we understand this, once we have complete faith in the existence of this master intelligence, once we know God, we no longer desire to change the world, but immediately sense that our salvation as individuals lies in attuning ourselves to it. No man, living in pride and vanity, can do this simple thing. Whether his ego is bloated because of his sense of superiority, or whether it is involuted because of his sense of inferiority, it is one and the same. He has cut himself off from the roots of his being and no longer has the slightest wish to attune himself to the world, but rather insists that the world itself be changed. He is like a spoiled child, unheeding of others, unheeding of the plan by which the household is run. He thinks only of himself, sometimes even deluding himself that he is thinking of others, but he cannot see others at all. All things, all people, all events are only extensions of his ego, and as he is hurt, bitter, revengeful, joyful, victorious, or defeated, so the world must change to meet his every mood. It is small wonder that he eventually is brought to his knees by force, by the laws of the universe, by disease, by misfortune, by fate. He has sealed his doom in his aloneness. Defining the Ego For the purposes of definition, it is perhaps best explained that throughout this text, the term ego is used in the spiritual sense of the isolation of the individual self from the universal self, 
which is God. Under no circumstances is it to be interpreted solely in its popular sense as conceit. Conceit, a sense of superiority, is only one face of ego. The other face is conceit's opposite, a sense of personal unworthiness, the all-too-prevalent inferiority complex The truly successful people in this world do not live in the ego. The successful person has subjected his ego to a greater power through a sense of personal devotion to a flame. He does not always understand whether he calls it God or not. It is the unsuccessful, the harried, the unloved who are bound by the ego, so turned in on themselves, so convinced in mind, body, and spirit that the world is a conspiracy directed against them, that they subconsciously are manifesting every minute of every day those very conditions they fear and abhor. It is they who need the great vision of the vast self underlying the egoistic self, of the power that is theirs to call upon once they have forsaken the ego and taken unto themselves their spiritual birthright. It is thus through a new awakening, a rebirth into spiritual oneness that all problems are conquered, never through attempting to dissolve the problem through an act of will. Learning to Decide Virginia was thirty-eight years old when her asthma became unbearable. She had lived with it most of her life, but now finally it had reached the point where she scarcely was free of it for even a few moments of the day. Anything set her to wheezing, even the slightest emotional stress. She had taken pills, shots, tried diets, moved from one corner of the country to the other, but still she continued to wheeze. At last she reached the point where she was both physically and mentally exhausted. She entered a sanitarium in an effort to regain her strength. There she settled into a state of complete apathy, refused to communicate with others, seemed decided not to disturb herself in any way. Her symptoms disappeared, of course, because they had been caused by emotional disturbance, and Virginia now had suppressed her emotions completely. Eventually she was discharged and sent home, but her family was horrified at the change in her. Her husband said, Frankly, I'd a million times rather have her with asthma. At least she often was gay and charming, and always a warm human being. Now she walks around like a zombie. It was quite a problem to restore Virginia to life. By an act of will, she had almost anesthetized herself completely. She not only had become incapable of feeling things emotionally, but physically she evidenced much the same anesthesia. She had an extremely high pain threshold, being insensitive to pinpricks over much of her body. She was completely involuted. The ego had turned in on itself by an act of will, and the rest of the world no longer existed for her. She had suffered, no doubt about it, but not enough for the ego to die. Rather, it had magnified itself, grown inward in its isolation, until at last, in its little microcosm, it had become an entire universe. Little by little, Virginia was led back to life. One day she was persuaded to umpire a ball game between the youngsters of the neighborhood. Much persuasion was necessary, but eventually Virginia took the field. Though she once had been an accomplished player herself, for the first two innings, Virginia obviously was confused. Each time the pitcher threw the ball, she stared at home plate with visible effort. She was being forced to make a decision. After what seemed minutes, she would call a ball or strike. Her voice always ended on a questioning note. In the third inning, the team that had been behind managed to get runners on all bases, and their leading hitter came to bot. He hit a sharp grounder to left field, and it rolled beyond the fielder. The three base runners scored, and the hitter decided to stretch his triple to a home run. Meantime, the left fielder had retrieved the hall, and he threw it toward home plate. The ball and the runner arrived at the same time. Everyone was on his feet immediately. The runner was safe. He was out. It depended on which side you were on. It was up to Virginia to call the play. Thirty faces stared at her, each in the grip of his own emotions, each daring her to call against him. She could not possibly satisfy more than half the people. She blanched, seemed to quaver for a moment. Then in the summer sun, with the dust yet floating on the warm air, she announced, You're out. Shouts of approval and disapproval were equal. Those who stood to lose by Virginia's decision, surrounded her in a moment, shouted at her, 
glared at her, seemed to hate her, demanded that she retract, tell the truth, not lie. Then something happened. A change seemed to come over Virginia. She straightened, seemed more poised, more resolute, possessed of greater powers. She did not answer. She turned and walked back to her position behind the pitcher's mound. Those watching her sensed immediately the finality of her decision. They retired to the sidelines. It was only a small thing, perhaps, a game between children that occupied two hours of a Saturday afternoon, but it changed Virginia's life. In those two hours, she discovered herself, discovered she could decide, could refuse to retreat, and she learned that her decision could change the world. Today she is a happy, integrated, vital person, all because she learned the power of decision. Outgrowth of the Indwelling God Oh, there is in us a thing invincible, a thing of such power that only the smallest fraction of it ever is unloosed through the greatest of men. What is going on in life is the outgrowth of the indwelling God, and each of us is a stage in the development of this drama. In deciding and daring to take a stand, no matter the hazards or obstacles, we are reaching upward, touching God. All the ages of evolution, up through the slime and mist of a newly formed earth, have prepared us for this moment, the moment we first decide, and having decided remain firm, and all the future ages of evolution rest upon that moment of first decision, for it is then that we exercise God power, the power of being, the power of creation, it is then that we know our divinity, our immortality, our mission here upon the earth. And so we must attune ourselves to him who created the universe, and whose hand is to be seen in all works. It is only by knowing God that we can in the end understand ourselves. It is only by knowing God that we can fathom the purpose of life, the nature of good and evil, sense the master plan whereby each of us fulfills himself as an individual and unites himself with the divine. The secret is breaking through. There is a secret which, when known and understood, has the power to set men free. It is not a thing that can be summed up in so many words, though it has been and will continue to be so stated, but is rather a thing of spiritual experience a feeling, an outgoing of the soul, a breaking through the shell of individual identity, a flowing together with God. For this purpose does the endless drama of birth and death and individual manifestation progress on earth and throughout the universe. To this end does each individual live. According as he realizes his own nature and his relationship with God, does he fulfill himself and life. This secret is rapidly making itself known over the face of the earth. It has become the common meeting ground of all religions. Whether you are Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, or Jew, you stand with your fellows as one man the day you approach your Creator with single mindedness and ask to know Him. He will not deny you. It is His purpose to enlighten you. Jesus said, It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom of heaven. You can develop your spiritual awareness by engaging in daily meditation periods. For that purpose, a meditation is appended at the end of this chapter and each subsequent one. Some are designed to overcome specific problems. All strive for spiritual wholeness. Each is a bridge between the individual and his creator. Each explores the nature of being. First Meditation I affirm that my true self is spirit, is not contained within the limits of my body had no beginning, will never end. This thing that I am is a subtle thing, underlying my ego and my sense of personal self. It is of such dimensions that I constantly must strive to understand it. It is not my body, it is not my name, it is not the identity by which the world knows me. It simply exists, unchanged by the ever-changing scenes of life, unaltered by any coloring that my ego may give it. This is my true self and I long to know it. I still the questions and imagined hurts, the vain goals of the ego. I slide deep within myself to a pool of consciousness that rests forever in absolute stillness. In a center as small as a pinpoint, I find infinity. I look inward, and there is God. All is contained in this center of consciousness. Smaller than the small is this pinpoint, yet vaster than the vast. Here I know myself. I center in God, become detached from my personal ego. From this vantage point, I'm able to look upon all things with love. 
I observe my ego as a person apart, with understanding, but with control. I see that I never was what I thought I was, nor was I ever different than what I truly am. My consciousness is the consciousness of God. I declare my unity with Him. I exercise no will in the things and events of my life, but concentrate always on attunement with the purpose of God. Insofar as I succeed in this I cannot fail, for God's purposes surely will be realized. I subject my ego, I yield my will, I attune myself to the power that flows heavenward throughout the universe. Chapter 2 The Secret of Secrets All-Pervading Spirit Many people, when they think of God, conjure up the image of a giant-sized old man who dwells in the clouds, and this vision, or rather the lack of it, is a serious deterrent to their spiritual progress. In the first place, it is especially difficult to unite with God if you envisage Him as having a separate existence from yourself, and this is doubly true if you visualize Him in an anthropomorphic sense, in the form of a man, for in so doing you cannot help but give Him human features and a human personality. In contrast is the beautiful simplicity with which God sometimes is described to children by their parents. Nearly all children sooner or later inquire, but if God is here, mommy, why can't I see him? And it is the wise mother who replies, because he is a spirit, dear. God is a spirit. He is that very consciousness that is you, that is all creatures, and his form is not that of a giant-sized old man, but is all form, the countless myriad, numberless forms of life. We can know God two ways by observing His forms and works in the world, and by exploring His existence within us. The first method has been largely the province of the sciences, physics, chemistry, mathematics, electronics, etc. The second has been the province of the arts, literature, painting, music, and more concretely, philosophy, religion, psychology. It is surely true that the more knowledge of life we have, the more we know of God, and it is extremely likely that we can learn as much about God from the discoveries of science as we can from the writings of philosophers. But the one place, the one irrevocable, indisputable place, where all knowledge is contained, our own personal laboratory, carried around with us every minute of every day, is our own consciousness. Here in the recesses of our awareness we can learn to meet God, expand the limits of our being, acquire knowledge, personal peace, increased power. As Mary Baker Eddy stated, to live so as to keep human consciousness in constant relation with the divine, the spiritual, and the eternal, is to individualize infinite power. The Inner You There once was a man, a sincere seeker after truth, who became so repelled by the workaday world and its apparent injustices that he retired to a remote region of the country and undertook the life of a hermit. I am going to get back to nature and away from people, he said. In this way he hoped to find the God he had searched for so long, and whose existence never had been revealed to him. He took only the crudest implements of living and disappeared into the western wilderness. Eight months later a forest ranger chanced upon his camp. Our friend lay seriously ill. His once robust body had wasted away, and he was in a state of delirium. The ranger called assistance, and the sick man was taken to a hospital. For many days he lay near the edge of death. Then he took a turn for the better. At last he opened his eyes. The doctor was bending over him at the time, watching him with care. A shout of joy gathered in the sick man's throat. He raised up in bed, reached out his hands. The doctor took them. The sick man wept, a smile of gratitude on his face. Later, when he finally was able to speak of his experience, he said, For eight months I had been alone in the forest. All that time I did not hear another human voice or look into eyes that mirrored human understanding. Always I searched for God, in the trees, the streams, the birds, the animals. I tried very hard, but the harder I tried the more the wall seemed to grow between me and that. Then I fell ill, eventually lost consciousness. When I awakened in the hospital, I found at once what I had searched for so long. I looked into the doctor's eyes, and there I saw God. I cannot tell you how I recognized him. All I know is that I was possessed by such a feeling of warmth and lovingness as I have never known. 
I reached out my hand, my hand was taken. Now I see God in everyone I meet. Now I know God in myself. It was a tremendous revelation for this man. He had been so blocked from love that he had been blinded. But in his weakened state, in his need, help was given him. He loved. When he loved, he saw God. The Outer Mask What is the nature of this infinite, eternal, omniscient and omnipresent spirit that we give the name of God? If he is not a man, if he has no human characteristics, how is it then that he primarily is characterized by love, when love seems such a human thing? He is one, infinite and eternal. He is all wisdom, all knowledge, all power. We know him as he manifests in form, and as we see him around us so we meet him in ourselves. Love always will be the primary road to discovery of God, for that which is eternally one has divided, and the longing of the parts for reunion in the whole is love. Who loves God longs to meet God, sees him in others, loves others as himself. The world is a stage on which God is working out through matter the infinite expressions of his own nature. Each individual, then, is one of the manifold expressions of God, yet each is altogether God, for God does not divide himself, but rather plays each separate role. Human personality, or ego, is only a disguise which God for a moment has pleased himself to don, in which, for that moment, he actually has lost himself, but which has no true existence, for what it seems to be is only the smallest indication of what it actually is. Within every creature Reinhold Niebuhr said, The self is not a particular self merely because it is in a particular body, and by so saying he summed up the entire religious question. Only one thing is at work here and throughout the universe. It has become all things, and will continue to become all things. It does not separate itself from its many existences, but actually is them, complete and entire. It has not created man separate from itself nor does it expect man to change its world. It does not stand in judgment on man, for why should it stand in judgment on itself? It neither rewards nor punishes. It knows exactly where it is going. All created existences are illusions it has donned to work out its many expressions. It refines each expression by conflict with other expressions, and the interplay of form against form, of form destroying form, is in itself an expression as thinking might be, or building one thing from the ashes of another. But in actual truth, nothing is destroyed, for only one presence ever truly exists, and why should it change or destroy or alter itself? That, which already is pure and complete, timeless and infinite. Delusion Charles suffered a nervous breakdown and was committed to a sanitarium. He was a thin, sensitive man, well into middle age. He was an accomplished violinist, but his talent never had been sufficient to allow him to make a living in this manner. Before his breakdown, he had worked for a money-lending institution. I couldn't stand it, he said. I used to take my job home with me at nights. The idea of people needing things and not having the money and having to borrow it and not being able to pay it back. All I could ask myself was why. Why do some people have to live off the misery of others? Why do we fight each other, beat each other, own things at the expense of others? Good God in heaven, we even have to kill living things to eat? Charles had an incomplete idea of heaven, and hardly even a partial view of God's created universe. He separated all things into good and evil. The good things were those that benefited him, or gave him pleasure, or pleased his moral or ethical sense. The evil things were those that harmed him or threatened him or caused him discomfort or displeased his moral sense. So he divided the world in two. Bad things had been created by the devil. Good things had been created by God. The obvious war that continually existed between these factors he mentally had chalked up to a war between God and the devil, and even his own self, his soul, he fancied enmeshed in the midst of this war, pulled two ways, now belonging to God, now to the devil, its eventual end uncertain as he faced the tides and forces of each day. No wonder he had suffered a mental breakdown. Yet, in a manner, every one of us is a Charles, and every one of us, without the pure vision of a God who is each of his creatures, 
suffers all of Charles's anguish. Separate from God we flounder through life, victims of each circumstance we meet. United with God we rise above circumstance, attract to ourselves those circumstances we truly desire, eventually seem to create circumstances. Our roots are in another world, and we stride through life with seven league boots, loving, being loved, emanating power. Charles eventually was restored to an active and joyful life by an act of spiritual illumination that involved only himself and God. No one was with him when it happened, but many bear witness to the change in this man. Where before he seemed a straw in each wind, flying this way and that, torn always between conflicting desires and emotions, frail in both body and spirit, today he stands strong and steadfast, a rock to his family and friends. He is not bigger physically, but he seems bigger. There is sweep and dimension to his spirit. It stands in his face, looks out of his eyes. He describes the change simply. I had come to the end of my rope, he says, and I knew I could go on no longer. I felt something die within me. There was bleakness, stillness, absolute coldness. Then God came. I knew it was He. Peace, joy, complete security possessed me. I have faith now, abiding trust, absolute unity with Him. The lesson that Charles learned, the first spiritual lesson that each of us must learn, is that God is for us and never against us. When we know this truly, we begin to live up to God rather than living in fear of Him. We begin to live in His lovingness rather than in some fancied tyranny. And we begin to live as men, tall in the face of all evil. We learn not to fear, for God is in us. Secret of Secrets This, then, is the secret of secrets. God dwells within each of us. He is our true self. We have no other. To understand this towering truth, not merely with the intellect, but with the entire being, to feel it, to know it, is to change one's life. The world then appears different, because the world then is different. The interplay of things and events takes on new significance. Where before all seemed the work of a machine, now all is seen as the work of God. Wrote Sri Aurobindo, the one secure and all-reconciling truth which is the very foundation of the universe is this, that life is the manifestation of an uncreated self and spirit, and the key to life's hidden secret is the true relation of this spirit with its own created existences. All spiritual experience recorded since man first became literate tells us the same thing. There is one God, one God only. Men have met him on mountaintops, in abbey cells, in fields, in homes, in factories, yet always they testify to one God only, a loving God whom they find within themselves. This is the Creator who made the world of his own substance, who dwells within the heart of each creature, who looks out upon the world through every pair of eyes. He is all things, good and evil, high and low, just and unjust, for in His creation all things progress through stress and strain, testing and trial, and all things are known and judged through His eyes only, not through the eyes of a particular ego or group of egos. There is no evil in the eyes of God, no injustice, no pain, no destruction. These are man-made valuations, have no place in eternal being, minimize themselves to the point of non-existence, when a man has resolved his identity in God. Everything has a purpose. It is no small thing to give up one's judgment to God, to stand fast in the knowledge that everything has a purpose and nothing exists but what it plays an integral part in the divine scheme. So much of life seems unjust, unwarrantedly painful, without purpose. How often we are witness to the moral, just, and kindly person, stricken with some misfortune, perhaps a financial reverse, perhaps illness, even death, and on all sides it is said of him, why did this awful thing happen to John? He was such a fine man. Just look at the town drunkard who goes merrily on his way. Nothing bad ever happens to him. Surely God must have his back turned. Well, it just doesn't work that way. That's all there is to it. God doesn't go around rewarding some people for being moral and punishing others because they are not. Moral values are man-made, as are all aspects of punishment and reward. A man is what he is, and does what he does because of his nature, 
and the things his nature has been exposed to. He didn't create his nature, and he didn't choose his environment. That far he is a creature of circumstance. The godlike part of him is his ability to make a decision, to take a stand. Once he has taken stand with firm heart and unflagging resolve, his decision will turn into fact. Always, however, he must realize that good and evil exist side by side, different aspects only of the same basic truth, and that in the sight of God evil is non-existent. Nothing is lost, nothing destroyed. It is spiritual growth in physical form. It is emergence of universal spirit from concealing substance. It is ever greater refinement of form through conflict with form that is going on in life. Competition is as necessary as sunlight. In fact, it is life itself. The individual nature hones itself to an edge of self-realization by throwing itself full-bodied and without reservation into the maelstrom. In the end, the individual is devoured, even as all individuals are devoured, but not before he has reached the limit of his capabilities, taken the flag a little farther, carried one step ahead the realization of God in man. Here, by development, by strife, by conflict, we see the emergent Godhead, even out of war and disaster, always triumphant, always moving surely toward his goal, striding across the human scene into eternity. So, life exists at the level of competitiveness, and life feeds on life, and the question often is asked, isn't it pure hypocrisy to pretend to love your neighbor when you can see he is out to walk over you, and you know that you are out to walk over him? No, indeed. Such a belief is the furthest thing from hypocrisy, but instead is the deepest spiritual truth. When you have learned to love everyone, those you vanquish, and those who vanquish you, then you have learned to live in a chord point each has its tempering effect on the other. When religion has become stultified by myth, legend, and superstition, science has proved certain laws that have cleared the air. Now, in a day when religion perhaps has become too prosaic, Science provides mysticism by stating that it finally is able to comprehend infinity, and in infinity it sees God. The Exciting Search Man is not on earth solely to build taller buildings, longer bridges, fly higher, dive deeper, and make explosions. Without doubt all human activity has its place in the scheme of things, but it is certain that all endeavor, all inquiry has only one end, the progressive emergence of God out of matter. Of God out of man. To this end, certain fields of inquiry into the nature of God and man have grown in the past decade. These are psychology, parapsychology, and mystical philosophy. Mystical philosophy is as old as recorded history, perhaps older, but its modern interpretation and application are fairly recent. The wealth of writings left by the Taoists, the Essenes, the mystical Hindus, Buddhists, and Egyptians are now being found to contain spiritual and psychological truths as applicable to the modern state of man as they were many centuries ago. Mystical philosophy today most properly joins the old world and the new, provides a common meeting ground for modern science and ancient mysticism. It can be found in much of religion, is actually the basis of many of the new thought groups that have sprung up throughout the world. Psychology is perhaps the second oldest of the more subtle fields of human inquiry. As a study of the mental and moral makeup of man, his impulses and motivations, psychology has provided invaluable insight into human behavior. But the study is overweighted with statistics, has concentrated too heavily on groups and masses, has lost touch with the individual, and provides little insight into personal problems. Its offshoot, psychiatry, is the individualization of psychology. But even here, personal behavior too often is twisted to conform with theories evolved by two or three founding fathers, so that even though treatment is individualized, it still is based on the individual falling into a category. In parapsychology, however, there has arrived a new and exciting field, one that promises much, perhaps is even a gateway to man's discovery of his greater self and his vast invisible powers. Parapsychology concerns itself with the study of the unknown but suspected powers of the mind, extrasensory perception, thought transference, clairvoyance, precognition. Recent disclosures of a somewhat sensational nature tend to magnify the actual results achieved by this study, but the establishment of chairs of parapsychology at some of our leading universities is proof that the study has arrived as an art, if not a science. 
Statistics compiled in endless experiments show that one man can read the mind of another, foretell events, see and hear events at a distance, generally surmount all limitations that would seem to be imposed upon him because his existence is confined within the fleshy limits of his body. A dream. One night Joe had a strange dream. He dreamed that he awoke in a strange room. The lights were on, and seated in a chair was a small middle-aged man wearing thick glasses. The man said, Open the window and walk along the ledge to the corner of the building. There you will find a drain pipe. Slide down it to the ground. Then he faded away. After a while the dream recurred. This went on all night. In the morning Joe was shaken and exhausted. For several weeks he couldn't get the dream out of his mind. As time passed, however, it became less vivid. In the spring of the following year, Joe's firm sent him east for a tour of sales outlets, and in a small Midwestern town he awoke one night in the same hotel room of his dream. He had not noticed the similarity when he went to bed, but when he awoke, he knew at once it was the same room. He looked at the chair by his bedside, fully expecting to see the small gray-haired man who wore glasses, but nobody was there. Yet the feeling of repetition, of exact sameness, was strong and persisted. Joe arose and began to pace back and forth. Almost at once he felt heat and heard the shouts of terrified people. Running to the window, he saw flames licking out from the floors below him. He ran to the door. Smoke billowed in, fire blazed upward. For an instant he panicked, then he remembered the words of the man in his dream. He went to the window, opened it, found the ledge, walked along it to the corner. There was the drain pipe. He slid down it to the ground, blistering his hands in the process, but arriving safely. Dozens of people perished that night. Nobody escaped from the upper floor but Joe. There was considerable speculation over how he had managed. An old-timer on one of the newspapers, a reporter, said to him, You made it out just like old Alex. Joe asked who Alex was. The reporter told him that there had been a similar fire at the hotel fifteen years before. Alex had been a traveling salesman and he had escaped from the upper floor by sliding down the drainpipe. Joe wanted to know where Alex was now and was informed that Alex had died. What did he look like? Joe asked. Little guy, said the reporter. Gray hair, wore thick glasses. Below consciousness. There is in man, below the level of his consciousness, a vaster mind, a mind of enormous power and knowledge a mind universal in scope, common to all men, but exclusive to none. It is this mind that provides the study of parapsychology, universal mind. If one man can detect the thoughts of another, it is obvious that there must be some kind of contact between minds. Many people have likened this contact to radio sending and receiving stations, as if thoughts were like radio waves. But an enormous bulk of evidence supports the premise that instead of individual minds contacting each other, there is in each of us another different mind, a mind we seldom consciously use, one that exercises a vast influence, a mind in which there is no space, no time, and which contains all knowledge. This is the mind of God. It is the part of man that is indestructible, unchanging, fraught with all possibility, infinite potentiality. It is the mind in which each man fuses with his neighbor, becomes one with him and with God. Facing Facts So the nature of life is a universal intelligence underlying and maintaining all things. The growth out of universal mind of individual mind as the eye of God becomes the eye of the individual, and the gradual growth of individual mind to encompass or unite with universal mind. The end of life is the individual becoming God, consciously, even as he is in truth God subconsciously all the while. This is the destiny of man. How, then, may it be applied to the destiny of the individual man, your destiny, now, today? Francis Bacon once wrote, A little philosophy inclined man's mind to atheism. But depth in philosophy bringeth men's minds about to religion, and there can be little doubt but what we are witnessing in the world today, a great return to religion. Men have punctured the hard rind of knowledge, 
have learned enough to know how little they actually understand. Science has discovered God, and desire for spiritual security and peace of mind again once is filling our churches. To meet the need of changing times, modern Christianity is interpreting Christ's teachings in the light of contemporary psychology, parapsychology, and philosophy. The scriptures of the Buddhists, Taoists, and Hindus are being similarly treated. All holy writ is being applied to modern-day problems of individual men, and on all sides one constantly is assured that he can think his way out of any dilemma merely by adopting the attitude that the unpleasant aspects of the dilemma do not exist. It seems obvious enough that an ostrich-like attitude is not going to make the problems of life more surmountable. The simple act of burying one's head in the sand does not automatically disintegrate an unpleasant reality. All problems, in fact, are only overcome by facing them, growing to understand them, and in so understanding them, overcoming them. The person who is sick, for example, and wishes to become well, first needs to understand that his sickness is only a manifestation of the state of his alienation from God. By attunement, by a conscious, spiritual, and mental uniting with God, his body will regain its harmony. But it certainly will not do so simply by his ignoring the fact that he is sick. Letting God Take Over Alice had a case of migraine headache that had driven her to distraction. She was not yet thirty years old, but she was thin, haggard, listless, looked middle-aged. She ground her teeth in her sleep, fought most of the day with her two small children, nagged her husband, met each task with a tense burst of energy, only to lapse into exhaustion. She often wept and confessed she was completely frustrated, unable to summon the energy and strength for her job as a housewife. I can't even sleep at night from thinking about it, she said. I have to feed the children, do the laundry, clean the house, cook the meals, do the shopping, uh, uh, nobody else. Everything depends on me, and there's so much to do. I just can't make it. Nothing depends on you, she was told. Not really? She snorted. I'd like to know who'd take care of my house, my husband, and my kids if I didn't. God. She smiled. You're kidding? God isn't going to do the housework. He will if you let him. What do you mean by that? God will do the housework if you let him. Probably he will do it through you since you are prepared and on the scene, but he will undertake all responsibility for it. He will do it better and quicker and you needn't ever worry about it or give it a thought. All you have to do is let him. She was puzzled now. That sounds like some kind of trick. I still do the housework, but I hypnotize myself into believing that God is doing it. The opposite is true. You untrick yourself. It is delusion to believe that it is you, your little ego, that is responsible for doing the housework. You didn't make yourself or put yourself on earth. Some other greater power did. That power is in you. All you have to do is recognize it. Let it do the housework. Let it do all your tasks, and your life will become easy and joyous. It was a little hard for Alice to take, but she tried. She began to reach for God, to search for Him. Today her headaches are gone, and she has become an attractive young matron. Her tasks at home have been lightened to the point where she has time and energy for outside activities. It was really simple once I saw it, she said. It was like finding a secret switch that turned on the power. All I had to learn was to let go and let God. Spiritual Equality Nearly all of mankind's ills, physical, mental, and spiritual, may be laid at the doorstep of the deluding ego which has substituted a small self for the great self, which has separated man from God. It is in the death of the ego that a man is set free. It is by identifying himself with God that a man attains to his vaster self, discovers the depths of his nature and the enormity of his power. It is by searching for God and letting go of self that fear is vanquished, that the dimensions of eternity are perceived. George Santayana wrote, let a man once overcome his selfish terror at his own finitude, and his finitude is, in one sense, overcome. And when we identify ourselves with God by living, acting, willing, and thinking in Him, we leave all fear and smallness, our natures soar until they touch the skies. 
Some people, when told that the way to spiritual peace and power is to let go of ego and identify with God, answer, that's a lot of rubbish. Instead of getting rid of ego, all you do is take on a greater conceit. The greatest conceit in the world is to think that you are God. That's not what happens. One doesn't set about thinking that he alone is God. What he sets about doing is understanding that God is all, everything in the universe, all objects, people, and things, and that the nature of God is that he becomes altogether each one. Thus, when a man finally comes to the spiritual realization that he is that very intelligence and power that created the universe, he realizes at the same time that all others are that power also. Instead of taking on a magnified ego, he loses ego altogether. He identifies himself with God, but he also identifies himself with others. He is God, they are God, they are He. Thus he arrives at true humility. He is neither better nor worse than anything that is. His spiritual condition is one of complete equality to all things and all people. It is this spiritual equality that is the mark of the mature person. He is content to be what he is, and he shows the same face to all. He seeks to improve himself, but not on the grounds of becoming better than or as good as somebody else, only to fulfill his own nature. He does everything easily, as if he had an especial talent for it, but the reason for his easiness is that he knows that another greater part of himself is always the doer. He seldom is sad, never fearful, always stands foursquare to every problem. How else could he be? His assurance is deep and spiritual. He knows that God dwells in the depths of all beings, and he therefore is equal to every occasion. How then can a person achieve spiritual equality and thus take the first step toward uniting with God? The answer is to cease living in the ego, and the way to set about undoing the ego is to curb egoistic desire. Desire always is the hallmark of the ego. It matters not if this desire masquerades as being altruistic, the cause and the outcome are the same. The cause is an attempt to impose ego will on God's will, and the outcome is a heightened ego if the two for the moment happen to coincide, or a frustrated and involuted personality if the two are opposed. Everyone has seen unbearable vanity and conceit, and everyone knows how a magnified ego always heralds coming disaster. Literature is full of cases of pride goeth before a fall. Similarly, modern medicine and psychiatry are finding that much of physical illness, and practically all of mental illness, are caused by the emotional disturbance of an unhealthy ego. The plain fact of the matter is that unbridled desire can meet only frustration, and those who live solely by their desires are doomed to mental and physical suffering. The way to fall into juncture with life, to achieve peace and security, is to curb desire and attune to the will of God. In this manner the veil is lifted. This is the road to illumination, to transfiguration. To much me. Martin was thirty-two years old when he finally accepted the fact that nobody liked him. Through most of his life he had been the fellow who always wanted to join the club, but nobody wanted him. When they chose upsides for childhood baseball, everyone was chosen but Martin. In high school he applied for all the activities, but met only rejection. In later life he had difficulty finding a job, more difficulty holding one. At thirty-two he was unmarried and in the depths of great despondency. I can't understand it, he said. I want people to like me. I try hard to make them like me. But they never do. Other fellows don't seem to care. They just go about with the attitude. Like me or don't like me, it doesn't matter to me. And they're the ones that have all the friends. Who are you? he was asked. He seemed surprised. I'm Martin, of course. Who is Martin? He saw it was serious and tried, but he couldn't break through. Martin is me. Are you different from those whom you want as friends? Of course. What makes you think so? I just am, that's all. Nobody has my problems. Nobody really knows or understands how I feel. Martin, he was told. Everyone in the world is just exactly like you. Oh, they may look different, talk different, but inside where it counts, 
they're just exactly the same. They all want to be loved, to be admired, to belong, and if these things don't come to them, they grow afraid and tense and alone inside. That's hard to believe, he said. They don't look it. They try hard not to show it, that's all. Suppose you're right. How's that going to help me? It will help you this way. The other fellow has the same problems you do. Start thinking about him. Start thinking of how you can help him. Put him at ease. Make him feel more confident in himself. Show him you're his friend by letting him see that you have a sincere liking for him. How do I do that? Just by starting to think it. When you think of his problems, you put yourself in his place. Identify yourself with him. Some part of you, however small, actually becomes him. In that way, you become his equal, never greater, never less, but the same, just as you actually are in spiritual essence. Martin nodded. It sounds all right, but it might not be so easy to do. What about when you're dealing with someone you know darn well is superior to you? Make an effort to understand that the consciousness that inhabits your body is the consciousness of God. Make an effort to understand that the same consciousness resides in the bodies of others. When the significance of this finally comes to you, you will understand the meaning of spiritual equality. No longer will the words superior and inferior have the same meaning, and you will become equal soul to all things. Start out with a simple premise. Simply search for God in others. Martin agreed to try. The first week of his effort astounded him. He made two new friends, was invited to a social gathering by a person he had admired but who previously had ignored him. Within a year he belonged to a fine club, was active on its committees. It was easy to see he was headed for social success. His reaction was interesting. It's funny, he said. Now that I find myself being liked, it no longer seems so important. Much more important now is the peace I have found in myself. All the time that I was attempting to adjust to other people, what I really wanted was to adjust to myself and to God. Spiritual Realization When we throw off the fetters on our minds, open our souls to the universe, we automatically attune ourselves to the purposes of life. On all sides, wherever we look, we see life expanding, growing, struggling higher into the sun. These purposes must be taken for our own. In so doing, we fulfill our natures. Each of our talents, all of our abilities, are gifts which we are custodians of, which it is our duty to develop. By this development, we carry life forward, add to the picture of the emerging God, bring one day closer the time when mankind shall exist as a race of spiritual giants. When we identify ourselves with God we make of everyone our brother, we open a channel of communication with all people and all things. In a sense that cannot truly be fathomed, we understand a tree, for we have become the tree. We understand all nature, for we have become all nature. And we understand our fellows, for we have become our fellows. To know God is to see Him in all things as well as in ourselves, and to see the living God triumphant in all creatures, beyond birth and death and pain and disillusionment is to become immortal? Who attains to this simple spiritual realization, finds joy. Seek God, find yourself. Will you lay aside ego and seek the will of God? In such submission you will find power such as you have never dreamed. It is not a case of whether you can find the will of God, for that question is always answered with the asking. That door is always open to every knock. He is there, waiting to guide you. He will lead you in peace and serenity along life's strenuous paths. He will solve all problems. He will imbue your body and your affairs with power, peace, and perfect working. He will show you the reaches of eternity where you will find yourself. Make the decision today. Say, God, I turn my life over to you. In all things I seek your will. I recognize that it is you who thinks in me, you who wills in me you who acts through me. I do not judge, I simply observe. I let your power flow through. As mankind grows to realize that there exists a greater power, a larger self that each may identify himself with and allow to govern his affairs, 
it becomes inevitable that men should grow into the image of this power. As God consciously is sought in human affairs, that much more rapidly must his emergence on earth approach. The day must come when all men correctly will appraise themselves as instruments only, will place their proper identification in a world of spiritual being. They will be what they are because they exist, but they always will know that their true existence is infinite, eternal, and changeless. Their consciousness will be that of Christ, and each man will have found within himself the source of all joy, the kingdom of heaven. Second Meditation I search for the secret of life in depths of my soul. I retire inward, away from the noises and distractions of the world. In hidden depths of darkness and peace, I find a core of my being that rests in absolute repose. There is no motion, no desire, nothing to be hoped for, nothing to lose. All roads, all paths meet and unite here. I am the center of the universe. Time and space are contracted to a moment on a pinpoint. Planets and stars, the universe itself, are contained in me. I sense all things to be myself, myself to be all things. That which lives within me, at the very core of my being, is that which lives in all others. Only one thing is at work throughout creation. Only one thing lives in all creatures. This is God. I surrender my ego, give up my will, give over my life and its works to Him. I recognize that it is He who wills in me, thinks in me, acts through me. I shed my ego, divorce myself from any notion of an isolated self. I open wide the doors to the power that flows heavenward throughout the universe. I house this power pouring through my being, molding, sustaining, lifting my life. I become an instrument for the work of the Lord. No more do I impose my will upon the world and its people. Always I seek the will of God and attune to it. By becoming one with the will of my Creator I attain to all power, for the purposes of God will not be denied. Each day of my life I seek the support of my vast self. I discipline myself against the strident longings and desires of the ego. I seek no personal glory or profit, but perform all tasks for the Lord, knowing that He is the task, the performer, and the taskmaster. All solace, all profit, all glory I find in Him. Chapter 3 The True Principle of Action Freedom and Determinism The argument rages amongst all who delve into theology, does a man have free choice, or are the events of his life predetermined? It is almost universally accepted that the two sides of this argument are incompatible. But they are not. It has become increasingly apparent that they are merely opposite sides of the same coin. Those who contend that God knows the future have withdrawn free will from man on the premise that what is to happen must happen and allows for no choice. Thus man becomes a puppet, grappling with forces over which he has no control, the outcome preordained. Only lethargy can result from such a belief. Those who contend that man has free will have adopted the concept of a fallible God, who not only is unsure of what is going to happen, but exercises little control over it. Man may impose his will on this God and change the course of events. Such a conception of life is little better than atheism, is certain to aggrandize the ego, cause pain and suffering. Yet the foregoing positions, each obviously incomplete in itself, embody truths that dovetail and stand together when the separateness of man from God is surrendered. It is only when one pictures man as isolated from God that he can think of man as a puppet or as imposing his will on God's. Let a man understand his identity with the divine his spiritual oneness, his complete fusion, and his will remains absolutely free while God's omniscience remains intact. They are the same, not different. Isolation and Unity Since God is all, he knows only himself in all, and not the individual egos by which we represent ourselves to ourselves. Since he is the only being, he does not consider things in the light of personalities, but only in the light of events. He knows exactly what is going to happen, and he knows all things will occur in him, that he will play each part, represent each force, resolve each action. He does not concern himself about which of his myriad forms will be best suited to undertake a particular role in a particular event. 
he simply becomes many different forms and takes his delight from the play of form on form and the eventual resolving of the best form for the part. It is this restless movement on the part of the divine that brings light, color, action, and personality into the world. That the doctrines of free will and predestination are only partial truths is readily illustrated. Hinduism, for example, while based on some of the most beautiful theological tenets in recorded history, nevertheless has corrupted its disciples into lethargy through its efforts to annihilate human personality. In its doctrine of preordination, its establishment of the class system, in its complete surrender of personality in the nihilism of nirvana, Hinduism has created throughout Asia a kind of people who surrender to circumstance, refuse to make effort, are resigned to the lowliest of fates. What many of the Hindu writings stress, union of God with man, modern Hinduism has interpreted as the dissolution of man and God. This, together with the doctrine of reincarnation, has made the average Hindu otherworldly, anxious to suffer through one life quickly so that he may get on with the next. Social, national, racial, and individual improvement are practically impossible under such a theological system. At the other pole is the society based on ego aggrandizement, as best exemplified by the United States. In such a society, competition is the keynote. Individuals are taught that the end of life lies in winning, in being better, in getting to the top. Here we see the growth of the cult of the go-getter, highly stimulated people rushing about, taking on problems, seeking out competitors, always in the swim, always out to win. All who achieve success in their professions are fancied to be such persons, and this hero image has been so firmly implanted in the subconscious of most Americans that they spend their lives vainly trying to live up to it. They exhaust themselves physically and mentally. Tired heart muscles and ulcerated stomachs give way. Frustration eats holes in self-esteem. Nervous breakdowns are suffered. Tired little egos, sick and seeking surcease, turn to psychiatry, to religion always seeking the security lost by separation from God. True Freedom The way to true freedom is not by separation from God, but by union with Him. Only one will is at work throughout the universe, and that is the will of its Creator. If we oppose it, we are frustrated, eventually destroyed. If we attune to it, we are serene, all-powerful. By union with God His will becomes our will, and we are set free. It is difficult for many to understand that by surrendering one's will, one can find freedom. That in living under the dominion of God, searching always for attunement, completely subjecting one's personality, actions, works, and thoughts to a higher and greater power. The qualities of aggressiveness, worldly interest, ambition, and zest can still remain. But remain they do, now heightened to a remarkable degree, so that a person attuned is as a power compounded upon himself moving through life sedately, yet accomplishing mountains of work, with seemingly little effort. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah? Life's Law This discussion took place in the study of a large home. Jacob was a successful businessman once had held the chair of philosophy at a leading university. He was being visited by his friend Walter, who had undergone severe business reverses and was separated from his family. Walter was distraught. Jacob, knowing something of Walter's ordeal, had invited him for this talk. Walter had come reluctantly. The study was cool and quiet. The two men had seated themselves and were smoking thoughtfully. The silence between them was not strained. They had known each other a long while. At length, Walter said, I have been thinking of killing myself. Jacob looked at him keenly. Why do you consider such a drastic solution? For peace? I am tired. The strain has been too much. There has been nothing but defeat. Suppose the strain could be eased. Suppose you could win. Would you then find life attractive again? I doubt I have the resources to make such an effort. I am so tired. I imagine I have simply given up. Good, said Jacob. Walter indicated his surprise. Has it never occurred to you, asked Jacob, 
that there may be perfectly natural causes for the misfortunes that seem to have dogged you. Suppose you were to find out that there is a law of living, a perfectly just and valid law that you have been violating for years, would it not cast your present predicament into an entirely different light? If that law were pointed out to you, and you saw that you need never suffer defeat and exhaustion again, how then would you feel about living? That would be different, of course. Confusion has defeated me as much as anything. To know, to really know, would make all the difference. Here, then, is the law. Lose yourself in God. Lose myself, asked Walter. Completely. Immerse yourself. Feel yourself absorbed. Think of yourself in spirit as no longer being Walter, but as being God instead. Submit yourself, resign yourself, turn over your life, your every thought and action. You will lose all pain, all defeat, all sorrow. That sounds extremely difficult to do. No matter, do it. For forty years you have been running your life all by yourself, and now you have come to the verge of suicide. All right, then, before you chuck this world altogether. Try turning your life over to God. Cease imposing your will and desires on the great design of the universe. Discover what a mighty change is wrought in your life when you turn it over to your Creator. Walter agreed to try. Within a week he had recovered his spirits. Before the year was out, he was once again established in business. His wife and family returned to him, and his life has been improving ever since. He is modest about it, however. For the first time, he says, I truly understand what Jesus meant when he said, It is not I who doeth the works, but the Father who dwelleth within me. The Power of Choice But if a man is God in finite form, and God's will for the events of life is ordained, established, and unchangeable, is it not futile for a man to believe that he can alter his life? By all means, no. A man is only changeless in spiritual essence. In physically manifested form, he changes every minute of every day. You are not the same person today that you were yesterday, and you will be different tomorrow. Everything you learn, every experience you undergo, changes you still further. Always your life and abilities tend to grow into an image of your thoughts, so that you can, by making a decision, by taking a mental position and not retreating from it, Grow into anything you are capable of visualizing. It is this power, the power to determine the direction in which he will grow, that is the divine authorization to each man to change his life as he sees fit. This does not impose man's will on God's will. God's will is always in terms of events and never in terms of personalities. God sees the thing to be done and does it through one of his countless forms. He cares not which of his forms is the instrument. He simply acts through the instrument that is best suited, and that man who, by the power of decision, has best fitted himself, is chosen. Thus, while the universe is run by God, a man may grow in the direction he chooses. This is his inner power, his God-given birthright. Few men exercise it, all men should. The Purpose of Action Much of pain and sorrow is the result of men wrongly identifying themselves with action. Reward-seeking action has only one eventual outcome, defeat. Even the world's greatest winners are winners only temporarily. Behind each champion is the already visible outline of his conqueror. While it is undoubtedly the duty of each man to do his best, to reach upward, grow taller, outdo himself, it is nevertheless equally true that to make such effort for the rewards alone, money, fame, self-love, is the way of pain and struggle. To make such effort in tune with the will of God is the way of joy and peace. Action is always for the purpose of self-discovery and never for its apparent fruits. When we pursue an end for the end itself, we are deluded into regarding action from the wrong standpoint. We fancy ourselves involved in an effort to mold circumstances to conform to our desires, when in fact it is our inner selves we should be changing. Any attempt of the ego or mind force to project itself on the outer world is futile. In the first place, the outer world, or at least its coloration, is derived directly from the quality of the ego. In other words, each of us sees in the world those qualities that exist within himself. 
When he sees something that he does not like or wishes to change, he is wasting his time and frustrating his effort by attacking the problem in the outer world. Where it truly exists is within himself, and when he has changed himself, he will see the problem disappear from his world. It is because the ego is a finite and imperfect thing that our abandoning it and centering our consciousness in the perfect repose of God's self leads to such a vast improvement in our health and affairs. When our consciousness is centered in the ego, all things are colored for us by the limitations of the ego. But when we center our consciousness in God, the world begins to appear as it actually is. We begin to see the limitless possibilities of all situations, and we allow God's will to work through us without obstruction and consequent pain. Sri Aurobindo wrote, Always indeed it is the higher power that acts. Our sense of personal effort and aspiration comes from the attempt of the egoistic mind to identify itself in a wrong and imperfect way with the workings of the divine force. The Ego at Work Harold was a perfect example of a man who had cut himself off from the wellsprings of his true nature. A brilliant research physicist, he had graduated cum laude from one of the nation's finest universities. He went directly to work in the laboratories of a large company, and in twelve short years rose to head the research department. Harold had a mind for detail, and his energies were always at the flood. He drove himself and his associates unsparingly. There was never time enough in the day to accomplish all he wanted done, and his constant displeasure at this fact eventually began to alienate his subordinates. At last feeling against him grew so strong that the company was forced to consider replacing him. This they were loath to do, finally suggesting to him as diplomatically as possible that he undertake visits to a personal relations counselor. Harold was enraged. He quit his job. He took such personal affront that he antagonized his employers. When he sought employment elsewhere, they not only refused to recommend him, but made a complete disclosure of his problem. As a consequence, he could not find a job. He searched for two years. His resources became exhausted. He was distraught with shame and bitterness, did not know which way to turn. One evening he disappeared from his home, and a few hours later was fished out of the icy waters of the bay by a passerby who just did manage to save him from drowning. The examining physician suggested psychiatric treatment and recommended that Harold be institutionalized. With some reluctance, his family agreed. Harold would sit for hours staring into space. He seldom spoke, then only in monosyllables. His personality was completely disjointed, out of touch with reality. His overdeveloped ego had shut itself off from the world rather than face the fact of its own inadequacy. Treatment took the form of gradually leading him back to an interest in life. He always had been skillful with his hands, so he was given a woodworking bench and encouraged to follow his own ideas. Shortly, he was making useful pieces of furniture. There came a day when he smiled with pride at a particularly successful table. After that, his restoration was rapid, and in a few more weeks he was discharged. He was far from being cured, however. His ego was wandering and unsure, its security in its omnipotence gone. He needed an anchor, a secure mooring against life's buffetings. He found it in religion. It matters not the church or creed that Harold found. What is important is that he found God, and he found God on his knees. At the end of his rope, incapable of finding a job, supporting his family, being a useful member of society, Harold asked for help. He bared his soul, opened his heart, confessed his inadequacy. He turned his life, his mind, his soul over to God. His prayer was simple. I can't do it, God, he prayed. I've tried hard but I just can't do it. You'll have to take over now. Do with me as you wish. Today, Harold has transcended any success he may have won previously. His discoveries in research physics have contributed immeasurably to advances made in the field. More than that, he has become a friend to associates and subordinates, a loving father and husband, a man with a place and a stake in the community. His whole attitude has changed.
He radiates poise and serenity, never seems to hurry. I'm just letting somebody else do the driving, he says with a smile. Good thing, too? He's a perfect driver. Beginnings of Mastery When a man learns to undertake each action with perfect equanimity to victory or defeat, when he learns to place his personal desires to one side and allow God force, working through him, to achieve whatever end it will, he has arrived at the beginnings of mastery. He cannot be defeated, for he has taken the viewpoint of God, who is never defeated. He cannot be carried away by victory, for he knows that God's ends were being served, and that victory could not have been avoided. He lets go of all, and by the very act of letting go, attains to all. No matter how lowly his tasks, he performs them with sacramental care. He knows that in some manner the whole world hinges on what he does. He asks not to be shown the final end, or does he even ask for a reason. He realizes that, in God's good scheme, all things great and small are equally important. Subordinating the ego to God's self is the way to desireless action, and desireless action leads to mastery and power. It may seem a contradiction that a man attains to mastery by letting mastery go, to power by letting power go, but such is the nature of existence. All things are done from the viewpoint of God. Nothing is done from the viewpoint of the ego. By letting go of the desires of the small self one arrives at identification with a vast universal self, whose will is supreme and whose actions are omnipotent. Growing into God's Self Cervantes said, Make it thy business to know thyself, which is the most difficult business in the world. Indeed, little else seems to be going on under the sun than self-discovery. Such self-discovery has nothing to do with a man becoming acquainted with his surface mind and personality, but is concerned altogether with the study of the unplumbed depths of mind and consciousness. When a man looks inward, undreamed of worlds open themselves for his appraisal. Instead of the vital animal whose image has been revealed to him in the mirror, he now discovers cells on cells, personalities on personalities, ranging onward, downward, outward, for as long as he has time to contemplate them. He sees that instead of being any one of these selves, each of which is a momentary thing, he is all of them and more. For behind all these momentary selves is a vaster self, a self without beginning or end, timeless and changeless, infinite and eternal. He senses this self as the very core of his being. He is in it. It is in him. By losing himself in this greater thing, he becomes it. He is God. Good and evil. If only one thing, God, is at work in the world and knows exactly where it is going, then every single event, object, and person plays an absolutely necessary part in the accomplishing of its goals. Therefore, Everything that exists, exists for a reason, and all things from the viewpoint of God must be good. Evil is only another face quality of good, drawn by the individual man or groups of men about something that appears harmful. Evil is an illusion drawn by man to account for that which he does not understand, cannot control, and consequently fears. He who arrives at a complete understanding of God sees there is no evil, that all things have their purpose that this purpose is, in the eyes of God, always good. The man who guides his actions solely by what is considered good and what is considered evil is guided by his ego only, for he seeks to satisfy a compulsion that will aggrandize his sense of self. He may delude himself that he is doing the work of God when he chooses always the path that is sanctioned by society as good, but this is not necessarily so. He actually cannot exercise any judgment over the thing to be done for only God sees that. The individual man, following the precepts of good and evil, right and wrong, pain and pleasure, is as often apt to be wrong as right as far as the will of God is concerned. And if he is wrong, he can only suffer. Moral and ethical values are like good and evil. What is moral in one society often is immoral in another, ethical in one society, often unethical in another. For a man always to guide his actions solely by moral or ethical values means that in some hidden manner he is attempting to appease his neighbors, sway their opinions, seek approbation, build his ego. He who would turn his life over to the divine must turn over his values also. 
he must come to God in absolute trust, in complete subordination, with consummate faith. He must not seek to guide his actions along any path, but must resign all with faith that God in his wisdom knows the thing to be done and will do it. Pain and Pleasure Epictetus said, Two rules we should always have ready, that there is nothing good or evil save in the will, and that we are not to lead events, but to follow them. All individuals are guided in their actions by the pain-pleasure principle of existence, drawn to that which produces pleasure, repelled by that which produces pain. Such a sensual basis for living is perfectly all right for the lower animals, but when used by the human being with his complicated mental, emotional, psychological, and spiritual makeup, it is small wonder that he often is drawn in many directions at the same time, with consequent frustration and confusion. It tastes good to eat, but if we eat everything we want we will become fat. Sexual intercourse is pleasurable, but indiscriminate sexual intercourse leads to broken lives. It is pleasant to lie around, be lazy, but too much lying around may reduce us to poverty and a condition of want. Always the excessive pleasure produces pain, and the mature individual, conscious of this, seeks outside the pain-pleasure principle for guidance in his actions. Thomas Henry Huxley wrote, Perhaps the most valuable result of all education is the ability to make yourself do the thing you have to do when it ought to be done, whether you like it or not. In all things, of course, we will weigh pain and pleasure, but a course toward each goal should be chosen with full knowledge that sacrifices must be made. A young man named George, happily married for three years, was offered a promotion by the company for which he worked. One condition was necessary, however, that he transfer to an eastern office. George had no serious objection to this, but when he told his wife she was against it, under no condition, she said, would she move east. Her home always had been on the west coast, and she was determined to stay. If George decided to take the promotion, he could just go east without her. George was torn by the problem. Much as he wanted the promotion, he could not bring himself to insist that his wife go with him. In the end he gave in, told the company that he could not accept, and stayed on the west coast. During the next few years, he saw several men, all his juniors, raised above him. He became bitter about this, blamed his wife. If it had not been for her, everything would have been fine. If she hadn't insisted on staying on the coast, he could have taken the promotion when it was offered. By now he would have been a vice president at least. When George finally got around to taking stock of himself, he not only was earmarked for failure in business, but his marriage was on the rocks as well. He had developed a habit of placing blame elsewhere for every misfortune that befell him, had become psychologically incapable of facing an unpleasant fact. It's all because of her, he said. My wife absolutely refuses to think of me at all. If she's happy, she thinks everybody else should be happy. If she's unhappy, she can't understand why everyone else isn't unhappy too. He was told, maybe you are only transferring your own attitudes to her. What makes you think so? Because most of us are incapable of understanding anything that does not already exist within ourselves. We live in our egos and see all things as extensions of those egos. If you blame your wife for being selfish, chances are it is you who are selfish instead. Try looking at her without the coloration of your own problems. Try to see her as an individual, as a unique embodiment of God. And for goodness sake, stop feeling sorry for yourself. I don't feel sorry for myself, George said. Of course you do. If you didn't feel sorry for yourself, you'd have the courage to take the blame for your mistakes and not keep transferring it to others. If not accepting the Eastern job was a mistake, then make up your mind that it was yours and yours alone. You could have taken the job if you had been prepared to sacrifice a little. All you had to do was endure the discomfort of forcing the issue with your wife. She would have given in. In your heart you know she would have. What you really wanted was an out, an excuse for failure, and you found it. Suppose you're right. What do I do now? Profit by your mistake. Realize that nothing in life can be gained without giving up something else. A sensitive scale is evident throughout the universe, 
and the balance is always maintained. You can't hold things. Grasp them loosely. Be prepared to let them go. And whatever you do, face each issue for square. Arrange all your actions so there is no one but yourself to blame in case of failure. Through the ensuring months, George gradually managed to accumulate some humility. He began to see other people in their true light. He found a longing in himself for a religious belief, and he began to search about for a church to satisfy his needs. Eventually he found one, and it made all the difference. Today, George is still with the same company. He is a director and a vice president as he always wanted to be. And most interesting of all, he is in charge of an eastern office. Spiritual Insight What most of us fail to realize is that we gain nothing through self-seeking and everything through God-seeking. When we analyze people and events in terms of our egos, we give them a color they do not truly have. We are prevented from really seeing them, and consequently we live in a make-believe world. Things never seem to work out the way we anticipate because we do not truly see